Bennett and Deals and Alder won the Nobel Prize. So <clears throat> both cool. Okay, chemistry 3111. We kind of left off discussing the Deals Alder reaction. And Deals and Alder won a Nobel Prize for this reaction. And so it's a really important or reaction in organic chemistry. And the Deals Alder reaction involves a reaction between what we call a diene. So we have a conjugated system where we have two pi bonds separated by one sigma bond. And then we have a dienophile. So we just have one pi bond and we have a concerted mechanism that occurs. And remember that a concerted mechanism means nothing more than all the reaction arrows happen at the same time. And we end up forming a ring. So if you look at these arrows that are drawn here, what are we gonna get from that? Well, we're gonna end up forming two new sigma bonds and we're gonna end up breaking two pi bonds and we end up with something that looks like this. So we end up with a substituted cyclohexene is what we get. And something that I mentioned last class was, well, the way the arrows are drawn here, they're all kind of moving in a clockwise fashion. Could you draw those curved arrows for the deals auto reaction between the diene and the dienophile? Could you draw them in a counterclockwise fashion? And the answer is absolutely. I've just redrawn the diene and the dienophile here. And if you draw the arrows in the reverse direction, what you see is that you end up with the exact same product. You end up with a substituted cyclohexene. There we go. Now, if you take just plain old 1,3-butadiene, this compound here, and you react it with ethylene, well, you can get some deals alder product. It says you get a jacked reaction temperature all the way up to 200 degrees Celsius. That's very hot, and it's really low yielding. We get about 20% of the product, which in this case is just plain old cyclo, cyclohexene. And actually, when you're at such a high temperature, what's going to be favored is the retro deals alder. Really, more of what you're going to get is the formation of this product. And then it's just going to do a retro deals alder. So you just draw all the arrows in reverse and you end up just remaking your starting materials. You end up getting them back. So that's not very useful. However, what has been shown is if you have an electron withdrawing group on your dienophile, uh, we don't have to use as high temperatures. And so we can get much higher yielding reactions, right? What we want to do is have a dienophile, but we want to have an electron withdrawing group on it, and that is going to be the key to getting high yielding reactions for our deals alder process. Well, let's take a look here. It says when an electron withdrawing group is attached to the dienophile, the reaction is generally spontaneous. And we went over a whole host of electron withdrawing groups. I told you sometimes I just refer to them as EWGs, as I did on the last slide. So an EWG, an electron withdrawing group, and a carbonyl. Any kind of functional or functional group that contains a carbonyl, carbonyl makes a dandy electron withdrawing group. Why? Because you have a strong dipole between carbon and oxygen. And so where do we see carbonyls? We see them in things like aldehydes. We also see them in things like ketones and esters and carboxylic acids. Now, besides those functional groups, you could also have a nitrile and you should be able to draw the Lewis structure of a nitrile which looks something like this, or you have the triple bond like that. And if you remember last class, I actually drew the resonance structure for the ketone, which shows the delocalization of the electrons. And you should be able to do that for the nitrile as well. But you should be able to push those arrows as well. So if we try and do that, we're gonna move this bond over here and put an extra lone pair on the nitrogen. Let's see what we end up with then. We end up with a carbocation here, double bond, and now we have a now we have accumulated carbon. So let me go back since all that got erased it. Erased, not erased, it, but since everything was erased. Oh, fiddle faddle. Let's see here. If I have my nitrile like this, I'm going to draw my curved arrows like so. And I end up with my positive charge here. A double bond. Now I have accumulated system and I'm going to have the negative charge on the nitrogen. So just a little practice in drawing some resonance that shows how 
the nitrile group, just like all these other carbonyl-based electron withdrawing groups, um, can um, can withdraw enough electron density from the dienophile to render it um, reactive in the Diels-Alder process. Somebody asked me, can the electron withdrawing group be a halogen, like a fluorine? I would say generally not. Generally, when we see electron withdrawing groups in a Diels-Alder process, it's going to be some kind of carbonyl containing compound or something that has pi bonds in it. And I'll explain more about that later on when we discuss what is called the endo rule. All right, so now that we've got that established, we've got our diene. So here's our diene. We've got our dienophile. You gotta practice drawing those curved arrows. So our diene is going to attack the dienophile. We form our two sigma bonds, right? This is the formation of a sigma bond. This is the formation of a sigma bond. And then when we draw this last curved arrow, that's the formation of the pi bond, okay? Anyhow, so let's move on from there and let's talk about the stereospecificity of diels alder reactions. I think everybody here would be able to stand up in front of any, you know, first year organic chemistry or first semester organic chemistry student and explain the difference between cis and trans alkenes or E and Z alkenes, right? Here we have a Z alkene. Here we have a Z alkene right here. This is Z or you could call it cis. Either one is fine. And then this one over here is an E or you could call it a trans alkene. Either one is fine. And when we do the diels alder reaction with a cis dienophile, what we end up with is both of the groups on this dienophile being cis on our ring. Right? Both of our groups are cis here. And so this is stereospecific. The stereochemistry of the dienophile dictates the stereochemistry of the final product. Similarly, when we have our groups coming off trans off of our dienophile, we end up with our two groups being trans on a ring. Now, of course, in this case, you'd end up with another enantiomer. Uh, however, the, the point still stands that the Diels-Alder is a stereospecific reaction. And if you go all the way back to I think it was chapter seven, six, seven, and eight in Organic Chemistry One. We discussed the differences between stereospecific, where you get one product from one starting material, and stereoselective, where you get um, a major product and a minor product. So if you need to review that, you might want to go back in your notes. Well, besides using an alkene as a dienophile, we can also use an alkyne as a dienophile. However, in this case, instead of getting a cyclohexene, like we have here and here, those are both cyclohexenes. Now we get a 1,4 cyclohexadiene. So if we scribble this down, this molecule here, we number the carbons, we have to go one, two, through the first double bond, three, four, five, six. So you would call this 1,4 um, cyclo, I'm gonna run the space here, hexa, 1,4, cyclohexadiene, like that. Okay, and again, the same old curved arrows are gonna be the ones that we use to draw the mechanism. We have our diene attacking the dienophile. We form another sigma bond, and we make a new pi bond like that. But we didn't break both of these pi bonds, and so we still end up with a pi bond right here. And that is why we have a diene in our final product. Well, there you go. What else? What else could we talk about with respect to diels alder reactions? Something that you might have noticed about the diene is I always draw in these slides. Did you notice that the diene is always in the S? It's always in the S cis conformation, All right? We talked about S cis and S trans, and everything here is drawn in the S cis conformation. And we're going to talk about why that is in a second, but before we do that, let's try some practice problems. It says predict the products for each of the following reactions. We have our diene, we have our dienophile, and let's give this one the old college try here. So if we take a look at the diene, it's just one three butadiene. And if we look at our dienophile, could anybody tell me, is this dienophile cis or trans? And it's not a trick question. 
would this be cis or trans or could you just describe it as E or Z to anybody? Absolutely, it's trans, yeah. So if it's trans, then that means that it's E and it means that we're gonna end up with a trans product, aren't we? When we form our six membered ring, this acyl group and this acyl group, they're gonna be trans to each other. Now, if you've practiced this enough and you can draw the curved arrows just like this, I like to always draw the curved arrows with the deals alder. If you can do this, oops, not that, that's going to the wrong place. But anyhow, if you can do this and then this and then this, there's no problem with that at all. That's a perfectly fine mechanism. Uh, but if you like to reorient the molecules, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So sometimes I like to just reorient a molecule to help me draw a product. So I'll redraw the dienophile like this. So I end up with my dienophile like this. Then I can draw my curved arrows. So one, two, three, like that. Then I'll draw my final product. So I form a six membered ring. I have a pi bond in the ring here and my alkyl groups or my acyl groups, I should say, this is an acyl group and this is an acyl group. They're going to be trans to each other. So let's put one of them going up and let's put the other one going down like that. So we're going to have our carbonyl here and this carbonyl here. And there we go. Now, of course, we're also going to end up with the enantiomer in this case. So we'll put plus the enantiomer but I would say that would be a perfect way of doing it. All right, so we figured out the first one. The next one, will we end up with a cyclohexene in our ring or a cyclohexadiene in our ring in D? Would we end up with the cyclohexene or the cyclohexadiene in the product? It's not a trick question. I'm just trying to ask to see where you guys are at, if you follow me. Yes, absolutely, Emily, because our dienophile isn't an alkene, is it? It's an alkyne. Right before, it was an alkene, but now we have an alkyne. And we saw that when we have an alkyne as our dienophile, we end up with um, a 1,4-cyclohexadiene. Uh, uh, somebody says, are we always going to start with 1,3-butadiene, or could we start with any... Caitlin, don't worry. We'll try some other dienes as well, okay? Yeah, we're going to try some other dienes. We'll take a look at cyclopentadiene, which is kind of cool because the diene is locked in an S-cis conformation. But yes, we will take a look at some others. All right, we're just kind of getting started here. Is that okay? All right. Well, again, if you want to draw the curved arrows for this and say, okay, well, I have my first curved arrow. I have my second curved arrow and this one like that. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? I would say that's perfectly fine. If you want to reorient this, if you want to rotate that 90 degrees to help you draw the final product, there's nothing wrong with that. However, this time we're going to get a 1,4 cyclohexadiene. So we're going to have a double bond here and a double bond here. Well, if we throw in our acyl groups here and here, there's no need to worry about cis and trans in our ring. Why? Because both of these carbons are sp2 hybridized. Both of those carbons are trigonal planar, and so there's no cis or trans to even worry about, and that's our final product. Nothing to it. All right, let's take a look at the next one. This compound here is an interesting compound. This is called maleic anhydride. You might have seen maleic acid in biochemistry. Anyhow, this is neither here nor there, but let's practice it again. Let's try drawing our curved arrows. So the first arrow, second arrow, those are our two sigma bonds. We make our pi bond. We draw our ring like this. We have our pi bond here. And I'm just going to draw both of the bonds going up like this, up like this. And then we have our five membered ring. And then we have our two carbonyl groups like this. How come I don't write plus an antimer here? That would be wrong. If I was to write plus an antimer, that technically that's wrong. Or not technically, that is wrong. Why would that be wrong? Could anybody tell me why? I could have just as easily drawn these bonds as dashes, wouldn't matter. Could anybody tell me why I can do that? 
something that we would have seen in it's symmetrical. Do you remember the word that we used to describe that when you have a plane of symmetry down a molecule? Yes, exactly. We've got two chiral centers, don't we? But they're essentially an antimers of each other inside the same molecule. And so this is a meso compound. So let's just scribble that in here. This is a beautiful meso compound. Another one where we have an alkyne in our dienophile. So we're, again, we're going to end up making a cyclohexadiene. Um, if you want to draw the curved arrows, you can. If you don't feel like doing that, that's fine too. I figure it's all good. Let's draw them. Oops, that's not very pretty. Like that and like this. And then let's draw our product, which looks something like this. We have a double bond here, double bond here. And then we have our two nitriles coming off just like that. So not only have we practiced our mechanisms, have we practiced recognizing dienes and dienophiles, we also get to practice stereospecificity here, didn't we? We really get to try that, especially in the first one where we started out with a transalkene, transalkene, and we ended up with a trans product, right? And we even made a meso product in here. But the idea is that you understood that when you drew these bonds here is that they both had to be dashes or both have to be wedges. Great. All right, we also get some practice in using an alkyne as a dienophile, so that's kind of cool. A whole bunch of neat stuff that is covered in this question. All right, well, you probably noticed that I was getting a little bit ahead of myself in the last slide before we tried that question when I was going on with S cis. And, you know, if we just look at this problem, you notice, right, Caitlin, every single dienophile is identical in this question, and they're all drawn in the S cis conformation. You remember that? We went over this last class. Let's say you draw as uh, um, uh, 1,3 butadiene. You can either draw it like this. So this is the S trans conformation, or you can rotate this bond to make the S cis conformation like this. So this is S cis. And again, as Caitlin pointed out, it seemed like everything that we've seen so far, our dienophile was always this. But the important thing is that it was in the S cis conformation. Why didn't we ever just randomly draw it in the S trans conformation? There's a very good reason for that. Now, if you have 1,3-butadiene, which, right, Caitlin, seems to be the fan favorite, or at least the, in that question. So this is 1, oops, 1,3-butadiene. Right, we always draw it in the S cis when we're drawing, <coughs> when we're doing a Diels Alder reaction. Why is that? Well, there's a very good reason. Check this out. It says Diels Alder reactions can only occur when the diene is in the S cis conformation. So we could do the Drake mean here, you know, we could do Diels Alder reaction with an S cis, like thumbs up, you know, Diels Alder with an S trans, like put your hands. No, no, that's not happening. Okay. Um, we'll put here cannot, cannot act as diene in Diels Alder reaction, right? Whereas the S cis can act as a diene, <coughs> excuse me, in the Diels Alder reaction. Well, check this out. Sometimes you have Diels Alder, or, sorry, sometimes you have di dienes that are just trapped or stuck in the S trans conformation. Like if you just take a look at this compound here, there's no way to rotate this bond. It can't be done because it's locked inside of a ring. Therefore, like I'm saying, you know, this diene right here, this is locked, locked in S trans. And so even though it's a diene, if you try to react it with this molecule, you get nothing. Nothing's going to happen. It will not react at all. But check this out. If you go to the opposite end of the spectrum, what if you tried this molecule, cyclopentadiene? Cyclopentadiene, you can see that the diene is locked in the S cis conformation. So it can't rotate at all. There is no rotation and it's stuck there in the S cis. Well, as you can imagine, this molecule reacts like crazy. So it undergoes a Diels Alder reaction very easily. And um, we have our dienophile. And now, since you're starting out with a cyclic diene, you end up with a bicyclic compound. So you end up with some kind of, just write bicyclic, it's good enough. You end up with a bicyclic compound, pretty cool, huh? You see the five carbons from the cyclopentadiene ring 
Those are these five carbons that are highlighted in red here. And then these two carbons from the dienophile are those two carbons there. And you can see the same thing that if our substituents, the two X groups, if they're trans to each other, we see that one of them is pointing up and the other one is pointing down. Kind of interesting. And of course, you'd end up with the enantiomer here as well. And if you're wondering, hey, am I going to have to be able to draw these bicyclic compounds? The answer is yes. OK, the answer is absolutely yes. Also, if you're wondering, hey, is the mechanism the same as what it was before? The answer is good news. Yes, it's exactly the same. Check this out. You end up attacking the dienophile. The dienophile pi electrons come over, make a new uh, sigma bond, and our pi bond gets put right here inside of our ring. And so same old mechanism, but now we make a bicyclic compound. Very cool chemistry. Just one more note about cyclopentadiene. I mean, if you have um, just a pure sample of cyclopentadiene at room temperature, since it's locked in the S cis conformation, it's just going to react with itself. It'll just, whoop, just react super fast. And you make this cool compound, dicyclopentadiene. And so if you want to use dicyclo, or sorry, if you want to use cyclopentadiene in a reaction mixture, what they actually do is they'll take dicyclopentadiene and they'll heat it up. So they jack up the temperature on it. So they heat uh, to do the retro, retro deals alder reaction, and that produces the um, uh, cyclopentadiene, and then it can be stored at low temperature um, in order to, to use it. So kind of kind of neat chemistry there. Anyhow, uh, and if you're wondering, you know, what are the arrows for the retro deals alder? Well, the same that we always saw, you know, you would start with this, and then this, and then this. Those would be the curved arrows for the retro deals alder. All right, just something cool about cyclopentadiene. Well, let's take a look at these, um, these dienes. We've got three dienes. If I call them, why don't I call them A, B, and C. So we've got three different dienes. And it says here, rank the following dienes in terms of reactivity in deals all the reactions. Which one's going to react the fastest and which one's going to react the slowest? Could anybody tell me which one they think might react the fastest out of these three? I bet you know. I have a lot of confidence in my students. Yes, I knew you would know. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, yeah. The answer is B, isn't it? Right? Because the diene is locked. We'll put here most, most reactive since locked in S cis conformation. Conformation. Which one of these would be the least reactive? Anybody? It would be A or C. Least reactive. Which one of these is just a dud? Yeah, the answer is A. A is not going to react at all. So we'll put here for A. Least reactive. Least reactive. Since locked in S. <laughs> Locked in S trans conformation, S trans conformation. All right, and the last one is kind of somewhere in the middle. It looks like it's in S trans, and it is here, but you know that you have free rotation around a sigma bond. And so you could draw this molecule like this in the S cis conformation. There's nothing wrong with drawing it like that. Um, yeah, so there you go. So this one is somewhere, somewhere in the middle. All right, there we go. So now that we've covered stereospecificity, we've covered diene um, conformation, we've covered dienophile reactivity. Now we're going to turn our attention to a rule for diels alder reactions when we form bicyclic compounds, and this is the endo rule. So something that everybody has to learn whenever you talk about deals alder chemistry is what is known as the endo rule. So I'll just scribble it up here, the endo rule, endo rule. Very important rule in organic chemistry when we're talking about deals alder chemistry. Okay, so when we make one of those bicyclic systems, right? Let's say our dienophile is cyclopentadiene. If we do the reaction, 
with this dienophile, we're gonna end up, I can draw a better hair on that, better than that too. We end up with something that looks like this for our curved arrows, and we form our bicyclic products. Well, you can see that there's kind of two products that you could get here. You could get a product where the carbonyl or the aldehyde is pointing down. Another way to describe this compound is to say that the aldehyde groups here are cis to the larger bridge, right? If you just think about, you know, this bridge and this bridge, well, the bridge with the double bond and it is bridge bigger than the other bridge, which just has a methylene in it. So it's cis to that larger bridge, or they could be pointing up. Are you kidding me? Okay, or they could be pointing up like this so that they are um, uh, on the opposite side of the largest bridge. So now they're on the same side as the smaller bridge like this, and we call this the exo product. And what we find is that when we do Diels Alder reactions and we have the possibility of forming an endo and exo product, that generally the endo product is the product that's going to predominate. You see it written right here that the endo, endo position, you see that it's sin, it's on the same side as the larger bridge. And then the exo product has the substituent anti to the larger bridge. So it's kind of on the same side as the smaller bridge, if you want to frame it that way. All right, so endo and exo product. And you might be thinking, well, the endo product looks um, more unstable to me, you know, here you have two hydrogens going up like this, and then you have two hydrogens coming off of here. You have this one, you have this one, you have one here and one here. Okay, whereas if I have these carbonyls in the exo position, then I have a proton going here and here. And it's actually kind of less sterically hindered when they're in that position. So you might be wondering, well, why would they go into the exo, or sorry, the endo position in preference to the exo position? And there's a reason for that. It says the electron withdrawing groups attached to dienophiles tend to occupy the endo position. Often the endo product is the only product form. So we end up with our major product as being the endo product. Well, why is that? The answer is shown here. Now, the answer is pretty complex, but this is the answer that they give us in our textbook, and this will suffice for us in this class. I mean, obviously, it goes into MO theory, but again, all you need to know is what's covered on this slide here. So check it out. We know that there are p orbitals in the pi bond that is formed. So we have p orbitals here, right? And we also have p orbitals in the carbonyl groups from our electron withdrawing groups. And what happens is that it says here the endo transition state benefits from a favorable interaction between the electron withdrawing groups and the developing pi bond. So it's like there's an interaction between the p orbitals here and the new p orbitals that are being formed when we make the new pi bond. It's like there's a favorable interaction there that causes the endo product to be formed. Whereas if you try to do, try to make the exo product and you draw that transition state, the new pi bond that's forming, the p orbitals that are forming are too far apart from the p orbitals that are in the electron withdrawing groups. And that goes to your point, Caitlin, where you asked me, you know, could you have a halogen? That's electron withdrawing. Yeah, but it doesn't have unhybridized p orbitals to participate um, in, to produce the endo product, which also lowers the energy of the LUMO of the dienophile, which again is beyond the scope of our course, but hopefully that is, you know, kind of a partial answer there. So again, in a nutshell, all you really need to know is what's here, okay? It says there's a favorable interaction between the developing pi bond and the electron withdrawing substituents, and that's why we get the endo product. Again, as I tr was trying to show you before, the endo product is actually higher in energy. However, 
the activation energy to form the endo product is much lower than that to form the exo product because of that favorable interaction between the electron withdrawing groups and the pi bond that is being formed. So that covers the endo rule. Now that we've got that down pat, let's try, try drawing some bicyclic products where we have to invoke the endo rule. Give it a try here. And Mr. Dion's gonna do his best to draw his best um, bicyclic compounds. But again, you have the solutions manual to look at them if you don't like the way I draw them or something, but I'll do my best. So let's see here. Caitlin, are you happy? Let's see, we got a pretty sweet um, cyclopentadiene here, but then you have this sulfur containing ring. You've got an oxygen containing ring. So some different, some different, uh, some different dienes here. Okay, so something kind of cool. All right, well, let's give some curved arrows a try. I think to me, it's the best way to master this stuff. And it's the best way to really understand what the heck is going on. So we're gonna form our sigma bond. We're gonna break the pi bond in the dienophile, form a new sigma bond, and we make a pi bond here. Let's draw our bicyclic product. So here we go. Now, the way you wanna think about this is that your bicyclic product is going to have a five-membered ring because you're not breaking any of the sigma bonds in this five-membered ring. And you're also gonna have a six-membered ring. Look very carefully. One, two, three, four five, six. So you've got a six-membered ring and a five-membered ring. Emily says, would we say the endo is the major product or the only product? Emily, I would say it's the major product because you're probably going to get a mixture most times. Uh, and in the book, it says there are cases where you only get the endo product, but I would just say it's the major product. That would be the way to go. All right. So now that we know we have a five-membered ring and a six-membered ring, let's try and draw both of them. Let me show you how I do it. The way I do it is I always start by drawing the five-membered ring. So I go like this, like this, like this, like this, and like this. That's my five-membered ring. So these five carbons are these five carbons here. Now, if you're thinking, that's kind of funny looking the way you drew it. Well, remember, I'm trying to draw the bicyclic structure. So now I'm going to draw the two sigma bonds that are formed. Maybe I can draw that a little better. The sigma bonds that are formed, which look something like this. And there is my six-membered ring. So it's got these four carbons and these two carbons in my six-membered ring here. And then the methylene is up here. Okay, so there's my bicyclic compound. And now what do I need to do? I need to put my pi bond that I formed here. And I have exo and endo positions. So first I'll draw the exo positions. That's up here like this. And then my endo positions are going to be pointing down. I kind of draw this one on an angle like that because my, my bridge isn't the best. And I've got um, only one group, one electron withdrawing group. So I'm just going to draw that pointing down. It's an aldehyde. So I'm just going to put the condensed structure like this. So I'll put hydrogen here, hydrogen here, hydrogen here. Now, if you look in our textbook, he won't have drawn it looking like this. What he'll draw in the textbook is this. So just erase some of this stuff. And he'll just say, okay, you draw the endo product. So you have the aldehyde pointing down and then you would also get the enantiomer, right? You'd also end up with the mirror image of this. And the reason why is because you could orient the aldehyde group this way, or you could rotate it 180 degrees and you would still get the exact same uh, reaction. And when I say rotate it 180 degrees, I actually mean like flip it over this axis 180 degrees. So you end up with an enantiomer in this case, but this is the, this is the endo, endo product. All right, so it says predict the product. So Emily, I would just put down the endo product and of course the enantiomer. Um, I wouldn't even bother putting in the, the exo product. He doesn't, so just leave it like that. Let me tell you right now, Emily, there's going to be no, or if there's a question about the, the exo product, it would be more like this is a trace or something like that. There's not a lot of concentrating on exo products in our, in our class. Okay, next one, we've got this really neat dienophile here. It's going to, so it's a dicarboxylic acid. You see that it's trans. 
So that means that these two carboxyl groups, one of them is going to be in the endo position, one of them is going to be in the exo position when we form our six-membered ring. Do our curved arrows. So one like this. The next one is going to look like this, and then like this. And let's try drawing our product. I'm going to draw it in blue just to not get mixed up on anything here. So we've got our five-membered ring. We've got a sulfur in this ring. We form our pi bond here. We've got a methoxy over here. And we have another methoxy over here. Here are the two carbons. So these are the carbons in our six-membered ring, like that. And we're going to have one carboxyl group in the endo position. We're going to have the other carboxyl group in the exo position. And so we would not only get this product, but we would also get the enantiomer. Because again, you could rotate the dienophile and it could react in the other orientation. So there we go. Uh, let's see, the next one, we're only going to get a, um, an endo product, aren't we? I'm kind of running out of space here, aren't I? Let's, uh, I'm going to switch over to a blank document here. So this is 16.17e. I just like to have space here. Let's see, so 16. Let's see, it was. Sixteen point one seven E. And the question was if we start with this diene, this guy, and then we react it with this compound. All right. So what's going to happen? We're going to do our Diels Alder chemistry. So we form a sigma bond, form another sigma bond, we make a pi bond. And we're going to end up with a bicyclic product. So let's draw our bicyclic product, which looks something like this. We have the two methyl groups here. We have our six membered ring, finished up like that. And we're going to have the nitrile, the CN, C triple bond end, is going to be pointing down like this. It's going to be in the endo position. And we're also going to end up with the enantiomer in this case. And let's try the last one. It's another one with maleic anhydride in it. So we're starting off with this as our diene. This, we're reacting it with maleic anhydride, which is this really cool compound here. Let's draw our mechanism. Same mechanism every, every time. One great thing about Diels Alder chemistry is if you master the mechanism, it's the same thing every time, no changes. It's same old three curved arrows every single time. Never, never changes. So we have our five member ring, which looks something like this. That's not very pretty, is it? There we go. That's even uglier. Let's see here. Maybe I can buy. There we go. Something like that. And now we have these two bonds, okay? And you can see how they're kind of, you know, they're both coming off in the same direction. It's like they're, uh, it's like they're cis to each other. So we're gonna have both of those bonds pointing down like this, okay? They're both gonna be in the endo position and they're gonna be locked in that five-membered ring. We're gonna have our carbonyl coming down here like this. Our carbonyl, I'll draw the hydrogens in. There's one coming up like this and there's another one going up like that, but there's our product. This is the endo product. And why would I not draw an enantiomer for this one? Could anybody tell me why? Again, not a trick question. Anybody? Why do I not need to draw an enantiomer here? Because this compound is, you guessed it, this is a meso compound, right? There's a plane of symmetry running down this molecule. And so there you go. It's a meso compound, so we're good. All right. Well, any questions about that? Before we move on, we're going to talk about regioselectivity, which is the last section on Diels Alder. Regioselectivity. No, okay. Well, let's go into it here. Yeah, go ahead. Ask me anything. I don't understand how you can have the enantiomer and it's still end up. The enantiomer and it's still endo. Well, if you just draw the mirror image of this, right, 
if you, um, let's see here. If you take this compound, okay, if you, like imagine we were to draw, let me make some space here. If you were to draw the dienophile in this direction, right, if you were to do that, let me just erase these curved arrows. And if you did the same reaction, then you'd end up with the same compound, essentially. Okay, so you take this, it's not going to work, is it? So you would end up with this. We have something that looks like like this. And now you've got the nitrile pointing down here. And this is the enantiomer to the other compound. It's its mirror image. If you take this, uh, and I think this is Caitlin talking maybe. If yeah, you yeah. take this, yeah. If you were to draw a line here, Caitlin, Imagine you rotated this 180 degrees. Okay, that makes sense. So it's still pointing it? down. Then, then they'd be they'd be mirror images, wouldn't they? Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Is that cool or what? Yeah, it is. Well, maybe, maybe you don't think it's cool, but anyhow, I think it's cool. But that that was a great question. Yeah, it's not Thank as abundantly you. clear. Yeah, it's not as abundantly clear as when we just take a bond and you know, before, and you know, go back to chapter five, what did I teach you? I said, oh, all you do is switch a dash to a wedge, a wedge to a dash, done. There's your enantiomer. But here it's a little bit different, right? You reorient that dienophile, and it's not as abundantly clear that this is a mirror image, but if you understand that if you take and you rotate the molecule around that yellow line, 180 degrees, you do get the mirror image. So you end up with two and no products. Cool. All right, give me a thumbs up. Is everybody with me on that? That was a great question, by the way. Okay, I'm just going to assume everybody's with me. Again, never hesitate to stop me. I like answering any question about organic chemistry. And if I don't know the answer, I'll look it up, right? Okay, let's go back to our slides here with my trusty, trusty iPad, which is just so great. Where were we? Somewhere around here. Oh, we already did all this stuff. Let's keep going down here. We talked about all that. We tried to run some products. We finished that question. Oh, yeah. So this is the last section on Deals Alder, which deals with regio selectivity. I'll just uh, put this bug in your ear for my students. Um, this is new to the... Um, yeah, this is new to the fourth edition. Yeah. So we'll put here um, new to fourth edition. So if you have friends who have the third or second or first edition of Klein's textbook, this stuff wasn't in it. And I think, you know, Dr. Klein always listens to the, you know, people who use this textbook. And I think a lot of people were saying, well, you know, you covered stereo specificity. It might be a good idea to talk about regio selectivity. And if you understand resonance and you understand that opposites attract, then you're going to understand regio selectivity very, very well. Well, if we have a symmetrical diene or a symmetrical dienophile, in that case, we don't have to worry about regio selectivity. There's nothing to worry about. Um, yeah, so let's just highlight that. Um, if your diene or dienophile is symmetrical, there's only going to be one regiochemical outcome. Right, Caitlin? It wouldn't matter if I oriented the dienophile in this direction or if I put it like this and I drew the same mechanism, I would end up with this compound like this, which is the exact same as this, right? You end up with only one product. And hopefully it's even more abundantly clear that if you were to rotate this around this bond 180 degrees, then you still get the same product, right? Okay, well, that's fine. Uh, however, what if you have um, you know, an unsymmetrical diene and an unsymmetrical dienophile. Right? What if you were to try to react this with this? Then, you know, you could orient the aldehyde in one of two ways and you could end up with two different radioisomers. Well, is there a major? Is there a minor? The answer is yes. Let's take a look. It says, if you take an unsymmetrical diene and dienophile, then you can get two radioisomers. If you have the aldehyde in this orientation, it would make this product, 
However, if you had the aldehyde in this orientation and you did the Diels elder, right, like this, you'd end up with this product. So which why is the one in the blue circle or the blue box, why is that the major product? Right? And hopefully you remember what regio selectivity is. It means that you end up with a mixture, but the reaction is selective for one over the other. You end up with a major product. Well, again, if you understand resonance, my friend, you are going to understand why you get one regio isomer preferred over the other. Let's draw the resonance structures of the diene and the dienophile. So this goes all the way back to chapter two. I could have asked you in chapter two, please draw me the resonance structure of this compound. And you would have said, okay, well, I have an allylic lone pair. And so I'm going to draw this resonance structure. Everything still has a complete octet here. It looks good to me. Great, fine, no problem. Everything there is good. But what do you see? That one of the carbons in the diene has a negative charge. That means that in this structure, you could just say, well, it's got a partially negative charge in it, right? My oxygen has a partially positive charge because I understand the resonance structures. Either way is fine. I'm going to delete that. And then I could have asked you this way back in chapter two of organic one. I could have drawn this on a quiz and said, draw me the resonance structures. And you'd say, well, I have a pi bond between two atoms of differing electronegativity. Therefore, I can draw this resonance structure. And now I have an allylic carbocation. So I could draw this resonance structure. There we go, two resonance structures. But what do you see? If you look at the carbons that are in the double bond, one of them has a positive charge on it. So you could have written, okay, well, my double bond here has a partial positive and this has a partial negative. What do we know about negative and positive charges? They attract each other, opposites attract. So if we think about where the partial negative charge is on our diene here and where the partial positive charge is on our dienophile, what's gonna happen is those two carbons are the ones that are gonna be more likely to be attracted to each other and thus our aldehyde is going to seek to orient itself in this direction most of the time in order to form this as our major product. It's the same old reaction as always. You just have to understand that when you have an unsymmetrical diene and an unsymmetrical dienophile that wherever the delta minus and delta plus are, they're always going to align so that you get a major product. Same old curved arrows, formation of a sigma bond, formation of another sigma, formation of a pi. And are you going to get some of the minor products? Sure. But in this case, you end up with a major product. And again, this wasn't in the older versions of the textbook, but it's in the fourth edition, and I'm sure it's going to remain in there for the years to come. So let's try some here. It says predict the regiochemical outcome, uh, the major product for each of the following deals on our CMLE. Really, our book is really focused on just major products, not about you know detecting every little product in a deals order. So what could you do here? You could draw the resonance structures for your diene and your dienophile. There's nothing wrong with that. So we can start with our diene. And I'm sure you guys can do this faster than me by now. Right? You put in your lone pairs here and you say, well, let's see, I could draw a resonance structure. Oops, sorry, I'm drawing my resonance error the wrong way. You draw a resonance structure like this. So we end up with something that looks like this, where we have a negative charge down here, and then we have a positive charge on our oops, on our oxygen. So we know that we have a delta uh, delta minus down here on the carbon, on this carbon of the dienophile. Here we go. And let's do the same exercise for our Dienophile, did I say dienophile when I meant diene? Anyhow, you get my drift. So let's do the same thing here. And this is something that we just did a few seconds ago, but we'll do it again. So we can draw a resonance structure like this. And we have a positive charge here, double bond, and we have a negative charge on our oxygen. And so we can say that we have a delta, oops, and say that we have a delta plus over here. And so the diene and the dienophile are going to react in the orientation they are here for both of these. I'm going to erase all this scribble for now. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and, <coughs> excuse me. Let's draw the product. 
So let's see here. We're going to have our first curved arrow, our second curved arrow, and our third. We're only making um, a monocyclic product. And it's going to look something like this, where we have our methoxy up here, and then we have our aldehyde over here. There we go. And that's it. What about the next one? Would it react in the orientation that the diene and the dienophile are here? Or would I have to change the orientation of my dienophile? Does anybody know? Would it react as it's drawn in black? Or would it react as it's drawn in blue? Could anybody figure that one out? All right, they're going to react in the orientation that they're shown here. Why is that? Well, let's review. We could draw a resonance structure for our diene. Let's draw the diene. And I'll erase this after, but let's just give it a shot here. So I would push my electrons like this. I've got an allylic lone pair. So you would draw resonance structure like this. And we'd have the positive charge on our oxygen and our negative charge here. So we know that the carbon, this carbon of our diene is partially negatively charged. There we go. Finish that. And then for our nitrile, we draw the nitrile out. It's going to look like this, where we draw our resonance structure. And I think we did this already today. So we'll go a little quicker here. There we go. So we have our nitrogen with two bonds, two lone pairs, and we have a positive charge here. So we know that this carbon of the dienophile is delta plus. And we know that the delta plus is going to be attracted to the delta minus. And so the orientation that they're shown here is the correct orientation for our Diels Alder reaction. So I'm just going to delete all that and let's draw the product. So we've got our first curved arrow, our second curved arrow, and our last one in our product. It's going to look like this, where we have our double bond here. Oops, where we have our methoxy group. And then we have our nitrile there. And for the last one, I'll go a little bit quicker this time. We could draw a resonance structure for our diene, where we push these electrons like this. So we know that this carbon is delta minus, and there we go. And then for our dienophile, since this is an ester, right? if I just try to manipulate the structure here a little bit, and if I just draw the carbonyl like this, we know that we could draw a resonance structure like this, which means that our dienophile, the partial positive charge is here, and therefore our dienophile is not in the correct orientation, we would have to put it like this. So one, uh, we'd have to have it like this, one, two, three, and then have our ester down here. So we're not going to have it react like this. We're going to have it react in the orientation that I have shown here, because that way our delta plus and our delta minus are on the same side. We're going to form our first sigma bond, our second sigma bond, and we're going to form our new pi bond. And now, since we have a cyclic, Diene, we're going to form a bicyclic product, and our bicyclic product is going to have a five membered ring in it, like this. We have our ethoxy group over here. We finish up the ring, which looks something like this. 
And we're gonna also have a pi bond here. So we don't have to worry about endo or exo. And I kind of running out of space here. But we're gonna have our ester group down here like that. And there you have it. So we figured out the major product for each one of these reactions. Um, in the uh, determining the, the correct radiochemical outcome for each one of these reactions. All right, so the last problems that I have in here, there's two of them. There's question 16.42, which just says predict the products for all of these deals, all the reactions. And then we have question 16.7, which is a great question. I kind of printed it really small here, but it just says identify the reagents that you would use to prepare each of the following deals alder reaction uh, deals alder uh, products and so you know here you really have to practice your retro deals alder arrows going backwards so you reform your dienophile and you form your diene like this so that's how you would do that and then you just draw the reactants but what i'd like to do is take a short break and give you a little bit of time to try both of these questions and then we'll come back and we'll see if we can draw some products for question 16.42, and we'll see if we can come up with some reactants for 16.43.